The Dukajins are one of the oldest noble families in Albania, who lived especially in the 14th and 15th centuries. Their possessions extended into the northern territories of today's Albania, starting from Zadrimje in the northwest to the upper part of the Dream River in the northeast, up to the point where the rivers Cerny Dream and Bieli Dream join, including the regions of Metochia in today's Kosovo. However, the province of Dukajin is used as a toponym only in the Ottoman period onwards. This region in the Middle Ages was called Puratum, or in Serbian Pilot, and was divided into Upper Pilot and Lower Pilot. Pilot was a Serbian province in what was originally known as Raban, or more popularly known as Arbanon. The original Serbian term, Raban, Rabania, Rabna, will become known as Arbanon after the application of the Greek and Latin metathesis from which Arbanon, Arbanon and Albanon were derived from, from which today's term Albania originates from. Edith Durham, back in 1908, who was an English travel writer and a historian, spoke to various tribes across Albania, many of whom said to her that they held Serbian origins, originating either from Raška or Bosnia. We will come back to this later in the episode. Edith Durham also stated that she was told that Dukajin himself was of Serbian origin, as well as Skanderbeg. She provided a source for Skanderbeg's Slavic origins. She stated that the tribes in Albania would recall that Dukajin originated from Raška, a very well-known Serbian stronghold territory. Dukajin highlands are named after the area that Leka Dukajin and his family ruled over. Leka Dukajin, or Dukajinovic, as known in historical sources, was a great Serbian hero and an ally of Skanderbeg. According to the most popular albanologist, Robert Elsie, Robert stated himself that Leke Dukajini, as most commonly known today, is a mysterious figure whom little is known about. We will do our best to unravel the mystery about the so-called Leke Dukajini. To begin with, his real name is Leka, which is an abbreviated version of the name Alexander. The British historian and albanologist Noel Malcolm admits this himself as a fact. Leka derived from Alexander. Leka or Leko are old Serbian versions of Alexander that were commonly used in the medieval period. The birthplace of Alexander Dukajinovic is believed to be Lipian in today's Kosovo, Serbia. Leka Dukajin became a legendary personality with whom the rules and laws of North Albania were named after him, which became known as the Canon of Leka Dukajin. The set of laws were active in practice for a long time, but it was not collected and codified until the end of the 19th century. An individual by the name of Stefan Getchov, who was of Serbian ethnicity, codified these laws, which then became known as the Canon of Leka Dukajin. Although researchers of Albanian history and customs usually cite Stefan Getchov's text of the canon as the only existing version and state that it was originally written by Leko Dukajin, this is in fact incorrect. Although the canon is named after Leko Dukajin, there is no actual solid historical evidence that Leko himself composed the canon or in any other way codified the customary law. Historians agree that in fact the customary laws of Leka Dukajin, who himself being a Serbian noble ruler, had laws that were formed over many centuries, most likely holding origins in antiquity, and is said to have been a continuation or alteration of Sad Dushan's code. The canon of Skanderbeg and the canon of Liberia are regional deviations of the canon of Leka Dukajin, all of which have root origin from the canon of Sad Dushan. The most advanced set of laws in the Balkans was Dushan's Code. It came out nearly a hundred years before Leka Dukajan was born. Dushan's Code regulated all aspects of life and has influenced the creation of the canon of Leka Dukajan. Sad Dushan's canon was influenced from Serbian rulers that predated them, such as Emperor Justinian I's set of laws. 
In the 6th century, Emperor Justinian I, known as Upravda, was born in 482 AD near Skopje in the region known as Illyria by the Greco-Romans. He was of Serbian origin and has proclaimed a new system of laws included in the Corpus Luris Civilis, which was the civil code and the legal basis of the Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire. Sad Dushan's canon was influenced by these laws, and these laws gave influence to the creation of the canon of Leka Dukajan. These laws and customs were a primary way of ruling the populations of the Balkans and consisted of private, criminal, administrative, financial laws and proceedings. Being based on the canon of Sad Dushan, the canon of Dukajan had several parts family, marriage and wedding house, cattle and property, work, transfer of property, oaths and promises, honour, damage, crime law, inheritance and elderly law, and exemptions. Some of the infamous laws of the canon are those that regulate blood feuds. In Serbian, it is originally known as Krvna Osveta, meaning blood revenge, and was practiced by the Serbs, especially in regions like Montenegro, Bosnia and North Albania. This custom was then inherited by the various tribes of Albania, who were of different ethnic origins who adopted some of the old Serbian laws and customs. The so-called Besa Oath, which is considered to be a sacred promise, is found to have been in use across various Balkan countries. In fact, the word Besa, which means to swear an oath or give someone your word, is based off the Serbian word Besjeda, which means word or promise. Also, according to Vladimir Oro, Besa is related to the Serbian word Bjediti, which means to persuade, to force. Today, it is primarily believed that Leka Dukajan was a Shiptar Albanian. However, this can only be due to grotesque falsification of history. These falsifications were done in the interest of creating a national hero as well as a historical narrative. This occurred when the Austro-Hungarian decided to create the present-day Albanian nation and ethnicity. This project involved falsification of history, creation of a normed alphabet, language and eventually an ethnic group by combining various tribes of different ethnic origins in order to form the Albanian nation of today. This conspiracy was uncovered by the PhD researcher Teodora Toleva who accidentally stumbled upon documents in the Vienna Royal Archives that showed how the Austro-Hungarian took concrete steps in achieving this project. Such notable figures whose ethnic origin was falsified were Skanderbeg and Leka Dukajan. Austro-Hungarian historian Lajos Falosky worked extensively in fabricating history and some could say that he continued the works of the earlier Austro-Hungarian historian Johann George von Hahn, who is said to be the founder of Albanian studies. The Austro-Hungarian Lajos Falosky would create pseudo-myths about Skanderbeg, how Skanderbeg was a Shuptar Albanian and how he was responsible for the creation of the present-day Albanian nation. The idea was to create a nation that will be based on common language, thus diminishing the role of religious and ethnic differences. This would serve the Austro-Hungarian geopolitical interest in using this nation as a buffer enemy against the Serbs. The creation of such a nation would prevent Serbia from reclaiming the Ottoman-controlled vilayets from the crumbling Ottoman Empire and thus preventing Serbia from having access to the Adriatic Sea. Uh, when Austro-Hungarians decided to create an Albanian nation, they wanted to find a hero. But Albanian Muslims didn't have any heroes because all their famous people were people who had invaded Europe. They had invaded Italy, they had invaded uh, Austria for the Ottomans, so they were in a big problem. And then the majority of Albanians were Muslims. <coughs> but then they, uh, Falkozi, uh, who was uh, an Austro-Hungarian historian, Orientalist, writes in 1890s to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Austria. He was a close friend of Benjamin von Kalai, the person who took care for the creation of the Bosnians. He writes to the Austrians and tells them, listen, we have found this guy Skanderbeg. 
he is a saint for the Montenegrins, but never mind, we can make him a hero for Albanians. Recent historical <laughs> studies have shown that uh, the family of Skanderbeg, if you see the names of mothers and sisters and what have you, are Stanisha, Repos, Peposh, and what have you, Vojsava, they are all Slavs. The, 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 the writings of his family, they are all in Bulgarian. So he is, uh, uh, according to many non-Albanian historians like uh, Oliver Schmidt, he is most probably a Slav. Uh, but he was turned into a hero of Albanian nationalism and Albanians who do not read science, who do not understand how science is, if you tell them the Skanderbeg is a Slav, like sometimes I like to provoke them a bit, they go crazy. I mean, they say, how can you say he's a Slav? But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he was not a Shiptar <laughs> because the Shiptars are a nation who were created during the time of the Ottoman Empire. Because the Shiptars are different from the people of Skanderbeg. The family of Skanderbeg was a Byzantine and Slavic family. While the Shiptar, <laughs> they are people who were created out of Muslims who lived in the western provinces of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans. This is the charter of Jovan Kastriotic, Skanderbeg's father, to the Hiranda Monastery from 1426. The charter is called the Second Hiranda Act. It was written in Cyrillic and in the Serbian language. In the document, along with Father Jovan, his sons Repos, Stanisha and Juraj are also mentioned. Namely, this is the second historical mention of Skanderbeg's name in Serbian form. The first historical mention, also in Serbian form, is in the first Tiranda Act. Along with the Serbian form, primary sources also show the Latinized form of Juraj as George or Georgius, but there is no primary source in existence that shows the present day Shiptar name of Djerj. Skanderbeg's father, Jovan and Skanderbeg's brother Repos, were buried in the Serbian Hiranda Monastery. They were both of Orthodox faith and Serbian ethnicity, as only Serbians were allowed to be buried and venerated in the Hirandar Monastery. Jovan Kastriot and his son Repos formed a tower in the Hirandar Monastery known as Arbanashki Pirg. It was formed to be a lookout tower for pirates and raiders. There is much confusion today about the term used in naming this Pirg. Shiptar Albanians of today claim that the Pirg refers to them. However, this is not the case at all, as the first historical mention of Shiptars is in the 18th century and did not become a national identity until the Austro-Hungarians decided to create an Albanian nation by unifying various different ethnic groups in order to form one ethnicity and one identity. The term Arbanas was used to refer to an individual that resided in the region known as Raban, which would then become known as Arbanon, a term that was popularized by the Eastern Roman princes known as Anacomnena. There are several key points that need to be taken into consideration over here. Anna Komnena in her works called the Alexiad, which is an important primary source, mentions the Albanians and she refers to them as the so-called Albanians and she refers to the Serbs as natives of Dalmatia who were sent by the Serbian king Bodinus to attack the Norman invader Robert Guriscard. This means that Anna Komnena considered these so-called Albanians as not native in the Balkans, especially in Albania. It is noted from other Byzantine primary sources, such as Michael Atariatis' account, that these were Norman mercenaries, along with other ethnic backgrounds, who became known as Albanoi, which was a Latin Frankish Celtic term that was used to refer to someone who was not indigenous, especially in the region that they were in. These Normans and other ethnic backgrounds, possibly even Berbers, were known as Albanoi in Sicily and Italy because they were not originally from that region where they were situated. 
They were brought to the Balkans by George Maniakis and they settled amongst the Serbian inhabitants of the region of Raban and along with the Serbs they became known as Rabanasi or Arbanasi. The fact that today's Albania is covered with a huge abundance of Serbian toponyms solidly proves that this was once a Serbian inhabited land. Now, we know that Jovan and Repos were not these true migrant Normans as they were a Serbian noble family who not only spoke Serbian but had true Serbian names and identity. The term Arbanashki that was used in naming this pirg, this lookout tower in particular, is simply a regional term that is used to refer to a Serbian person from a specific region, in this case being Raban, Arbanon. We find other such examples such as Montenegrin, Bosnian, Krajusnik, all regional terms used to identify Serbs living in other regions of the Balkan. Scientifically put, Arbanashki Pirg has nothing to do with today's Shqiptar Albanians. An interesting and perhaps a very critical point to note is that the Austro-Hungarian historian J.G. von Hahn, the original founding member of Arbanology, who supported the Illyrian quasi theory of the so-called Albanians, he himself disclosed the fact that Skanderbeg was a full Serbian ethnicity. Skanderbeg's ethnicity is only then said to be Shqiptar by the Austro-Hungarian Rajas Falowski much later. Laius Falowski was given the task of finding a national hero that could be used by the newly created Albanian nation in order to help solidify national awareness as well as create a false sense of pride based on the made-up romantic story that Skanderbeg fought for Shqiptas regardless of religious factors. According to Mavro Urbini, a famous Venetian chronicler and historian from Dubrovnik, he noted down in his works in 1601 that the wife of Reka Dukajan was the daughter of Stefan Sanojevic. It is absolutely remarkable to note down such a marriage, as only Serbian nobility could marry one another. The Dukajinovic family is mentioned in various sources, such as this register of all Serbian nobles in the Balkans. These sources date back to 1822. They are mentioned in the original Serbian form as Dukajinovic. They are listed as a Serbian ruling family in Niksic, Serbia. We also have a book written by a Jesuit priest in 1683, listing all the nobles in Europe. This is a truly remarkable primary source. On page 176 to 177, we see the names of Serbian nobility in the Serbian form and in the Italian Latin form. It also says the list included is are all Serbian rulers and here we find the Kastriotic family along with the Dukajinovic family listed as Serbian rulers. This source is indisputable and fully shows that both the Dukajinovic and Kastriotic were not only Slavs but Serbs. We also have another source book written in 1781 that listed all the Serbian nobility that ruled in the Balkans. On page 49 and 50, we find both the Kastriotic and Dukajinovic family mentioned as leaders of Epirus. There is not a single primary source that shows that either of these two individuals were Shqiptas. As simply put, that is impossible due to Shqiptas being formed as a nation and an ethnicity centuries later. An interesting source to note is this theatrical script that was written by a Latin Italian playwright in the 18th century who mentioned the Dukajans and the Dushmans along with other Serbian nobility. The Dushmans and Dukajans are mentioned in a scene called the Ancient Slavs. In the dialogue between Dushman and Dukajan, Dushman refers to himself as a Slav and as well as Dukajan. It is extremely interesting that a Latin Italian playwright back in the 18th century would refer to both the Dushmans and Dukajans as Slavs. The Dukajans, as well as other leaders of North Albania, like the Kastriotic family, had their own chancelleries and offices, which used the Serbian language and written script. This can be seen from a letter that Skanderbeg wrote to Dubrovnik. He spoke in Serbian as that was his maternal tongue. The letter shows that he was fluent in the Serbian language. 
There is not a single letter or document in history where Skanderbeg speaks today's Shiptar Albanian language. Along with his father Jovan and his mother Vojslava, Skanderbeg also had three brothers by the names of Stanisha, Reposh and Kostadin. He also had the sisters Jelena, Mara, Vlajka, Angelina and Mamisa. All of them are remembered and written in primary sources either in Serbian or in Latin form. It is interesting to note that in this Italian manuscript which is kept in the Merciani Library in Venice shows the coats of arms of Juraj Kastriotic which features the double-headed eagle having a white silver body with two black heads. Namely, this is not a lone example of Skanderbeg's coats of arms being shown in two colours. There are in fact a dozen such heraldic illustrations. The official present-day Shiptar romantic historiography claims that their black double-headed eagle originates from Byzantium and that their name Shipetar means sons of the eagle. But it is well known that the Byzantine double-headed eagle is golden and white. The double-headed eagle symbol was only used by Serbian gentlemen in the Middle Ages. This shows a good example of a transition from Nemanjic's white double-headed eagle to the black double-headed eagle of the Sonojevic house to whom Juraj Kastriotic handed over his sister in marriage to. The conclusion is very obvious, Skanderbeg's black double-headed eagle of today stems from the eagle of the Serbian Nemanjic and not the Byzantine Eastern Roman Palerogos eagle. Skanderbeg's coat of arms was taken for the present-day Albanian flag in 1912, not as a coat of arms but as an emblem because coats of arms must, as a rule, rest on a shield. The coat of arms of Stanojevic, who are a Serbian dynasty from Zeta, is shown in an old Italian book of heraldry. A couple of things can be deduced from this. 1. The Stanojevic are also masters of Albania, which is written in Italian. Two. The eagle was taken over from the Nemanjic heraldry, that is from Sad Dushan, only to be later taken over by the Serbian ruler Skanderbeg, who gave his sister into marriage to Sonojevic. 3. The eagle is silver and not golden as it is today on the flag of Montenegro. In another series of proofs that convey the Serbian origin of Juraj Kastriotic is this coat of arms, which is an Italian book of heraldry. In addition to the famous black eagle of Skanderbeg, there is a raised lion with a sword in his hand displayed on the coat of arms. This happened to be the authentic coat of arms of Macedonia, which at that time was ruled by the Serbian regional lords Brankovici. Namely, Jurad's mother is Vojslava, originally from this area. Her father Gogur Brankovic lived in the Polog castle on the site of today's village of Gradec, where Vojslava was apparently born. Until her marriage, Vojslava spent her childhood years in Polog on her father's property. The black double-headed eagle is the legacy of the Serbian dynasty of Stanojevic, which then ruled the state of Zeta, today's Montenegro. The symbol of lilies found is said to be the flower of the Mother of God, which is the traditional insignia of the rulers in Zeta, Raška and Bosnia, which shows the continuity of the crown of the Nemanjic. The Shiptar Albanians of today, under the guidance of Austria-Hungary, took the coats of arms of Juraj Kastriot as they did not have another national hero. In order to explain the eagle and the flag, they said that they were called Shipetars, which means sons of the eagle. They say that Shipetar comes from the word Shiponia, meaning eagle. However, in reality, Shiptar or Shipetar actually derives from Shiptoi, which actually means to speak, to be mutually intelligible, in the same way that the term Srav means Srojan, Sloveni, those who are mutually intelligible, those who can understand one another. The Serbian word Shipiti means put together and clench. This term implies a group of mutually intelligible people as only they can be put together and be united. Therefore, Shiptar implies mutually intelligible and united and had the exact same meaning like Srav. The word Shiptar, Shipetar, derives from the Serbian word Shipiti. They both in fact have the same meaning of being put together, being mutually intelligible and united. As Albanian linguist Javat Loshi himself points out,
There is absolutely nothing scientific in explaining Shapriya as the country of eagles and Shiptar as the sons of the eagles. Venetian historian Prospero Petronio in the early 17th century included a document that listed the Lucagians in the register of the nobles of Coppa after settling in Istra due to the Turkish invasion of Albania. The Dukajans were known as Dokaini, Dokajina, Dukajini, and they were listed as of Serbian ethnicity. The register stated they were nobles in the land of Albania, and they resided in Castle of Servolo in Istra. Even today's Shiptar Albanian form, Dukajini, derives from the Latinized form Dokaini, Dokajina, Dukajini, as these are all Latinized forms of the original Serbian term, Dukajinovic. In fact, Austrian historian Oliver Jen Schmidt admitted that in his recent disclosure of family names of all of these noblemen of medieval Albania, including Dukajin and Kastriot, all had Serbian Slavic names. For example, the Dukajin or Dukajinovic family members themselves had pure Serbian names such as Drago, Vuk, Budimir, Nikola, George, Leka. It is completely absurd to even attempt to claim these names as Shiptar, as there is no scientific basis for this. The Shiptar form of all of these medieval lords were fabricated in the 20th century. In the original Latin and Serbian primary sources, the modern day Shiptar forms of these names do not appear anywhere in the primary sources. In the folk epic written by Andrija Kacic, who was a Catholic bishop, the Dukajin family is mentioned as the Dukajinovic family, and Leka Dukajin's companion in the war was a Božidar Dushman. These names are all Serbian names. Kacic Mircic himself refers to Albania as Arbania, the term Arbania deriving from the original term Raban, as mentioned in Nemanja's charter. We can add to this that the first person with a similar surname is mentioned in 1377 in a Dubrovnik document named as Nikolas Tudorovic Dukajin and that according to Muzaka, the coat of arms of Dukajins was a white eagle like the rest of the Serbian authorities. If we examine Skanderbeg's name, he is referred to as Kastriotic. Dukajinovic and Kastriotic are in fact further supported by coats of arms dating back to the 15th century. An interesting armorial collection which has caused much discussion in science is preserved in the Bodnian Franciscan Monastery in Foynissa. This monastery was founded in the first half of the 14th century and almost throughout the Turkish rule was the centre of the Franciscans and Serbian Catholics. The monastery has its own large library, museum and archives where many old rare and precious manuscripts are preserved. It is also rich in many Turkish documents. The collection of Foynissa is well preserved and clean. The sheets are made of thick paper. The title is written in the Serbian Cyrillic alphabet. The surnames of the Serbian noble families and the names of the territorial coats of arms are written under the coats of arms in the Latin alphabet. It should be noted that the collection of Foynissa had been certified many times by notable authorities. Thus, the Austrian emperors Ferdinand II and Leopold I certified the collection in 1678 and 1703. The Republic of Dubrovnik on 22nd of January 1471 issued a certificate stating that the collection is accurate and that the original is preserved in the Serbian Hilandar Monastery. Even on July 6, 1700, a despot has confirmed that this collection is from ancient times and it is well preserved among the Franciscans in Foynissa. In the library of the University of Bologna, there is a well preserved ornate collection called Alfan. Alfan's collection is also important, as it was compiled by the Serbian priest Stanislav Rupčić, who served in the court of Emperor Dušan in 1343. This collection of Alfan is in fact a copy of an older book that has been found amongst the old books in the library of the Serbian Hiranda Monastery. On the same page is the reminder that the collection was made and dedicated to Count Alfan, and that is why they call it the Collection of Alfan, which was made in 1614. 
The collection of Alphans' coat of arms completely matches the collection of Korianich Neorich Armorial from 1595. The coats of arms are beautifully painted in the same colour as Korianich Neorich Armorial. The inscription and signatures are in two alphabets, Serbian Cyrillic and Latin. This third copy was not older than the second half of the 16th century, made according to the collection of Virgili Solis of 1555. As can be seen from these inscriptions, as well as the inscriptions on the coats of arms of the Castriots, the surnames of these families are written in original Serbian form. This is because the first compiler of the Illyrian collection, Petar Ohumcevic from Dubrovnik, considered both the Castriots and Dukajans as feudal lords of the South Slavs, especially the Serbians, and not Shiptar Albanians, as they did not exist in that time period. In the University Library of Bologna, there is also a collection of coats of arms bearing the Signature Codex 103, known as the Olavo Armorial. It is taught that the Olavo Armorial was made in Dubrovnik by some Ivan Benini, who was in Dubrovnik, who wrote the history of Bosnia. He worked on Dubrovnik's Olavo collection around 1689. Croatian herald Ivan Rabasha, who lived from 1783 to 1849, studied the coats of arms of Croatian nobility. He had the coats of arms of Kastiotic and Dukajinovic. Based on this manuscript, Ivan Vojnic edited his work called Der Adel von Kroatien and Slavonien, Nuremberg 1896 in two volumes. He published all these emblems in the famous German collection and there he published about two and a half thousand coats of arms amongst which there are two Serbian coats of arms, one of Kastriotic and one of Dukajinovic. In order for us to find out who the Dukajans were, let us take a look at Ivan Božić, a medieval period historian who spent most of his life researching the feudal lords of the Balkans in the Middle Ages. He published a book back in 1979 called the Turbulent Seas of the 15th century. Using evidence based on primary sources that were found in Venetian archives as well as others, he had managed to factually document the events that took place in Albania at the time. We will rely a lot on these Venetian archival documents in order to show the true picture of what really happened. Speaking of the genealogy of the Dukajans, much Venetian material has already been published, in whole or in parts, however, a large amount of data remains buried in the archives. On the basis of accessible material, the history of Dukajans has been distorted by present-day Shiptar Albanian or Venetian historians, so therefore giving a rather blurred, controversial and in particular having many errors in the genealogy of the family and historical events. The aim of this discussion is to, within the limits of preserved sources, provide the most accurate picture of this family and its historical role in the time before the final fall of the Albanian lands under Turkish rule. The question of genealogy is the most difficult. Speaking of members of the Dukajan family, modern documents rarely indicate Dukajan family ties, so it is sometimes difficult to determine who they are. Their most detailed genealogy was made by 19th century German historian Karl Hoff, who tried to harmonize the data from Venetian archives with what Jovan Muzaka remembered about family ties between certain dynasties in the land of Albania, compiling as a refugee in Apulia in 1510. This document by Muzaka is known as Historia e Genealogia della Casa Musacia. Also to note, his son Constantine would add into the appendices years later. Arbanologist Vikenty Makushev in his historical research also relied on Karl Hoff and his genealogy. This genealogy also served later researchers, although it caused confusion about which Dukajan to link their data to. This genealogy should be revised of incorrect data and only what is deemed reliable should be kept. Many members of the Dukajan family remain outside the genealogical tree because there is no possibility to determine which branch they belong to. Neither does it matter to show the rise and fall of these individuals as these are mostly people who had no role in the political events of their time. We have Muzaki's Chronicles which speak about the origin of Dukajan based on a fable decorated with a legend. There is hardly a grain of truth in them which should not be surprising because Mazaki records them after two and a half centuries later.
Mozaki's connection of the Kajin to the Trojans obviously had nothing in common with reality itself, but it represents Mozaki's intention to give them a noble and artistic genesis. According to Mozaki, some Trojans reportedly moved to France, from where two brothers moved to Italy at a time when the French king was going to conquer Jerusalem during the Crusades. One brother became Lord of Esther and then Ferrara, while the other joining the Crusaders remained in Albania and settled in Zadrimje, the region already in Mozaki's time called Dukajini. The founder of the Albanian house, Dukajin, was killed. It is said there by his vassals from Trafandia. It is said that his bishop dishonorably tried to approach his wife, so he killed the bishop in the church of St. Maria in Trafandia. The murder of Dukajin's family ancestor, whose own name was Dukajin, was followed by the massacre of all members of his family. Only Dukajin's little son survived when he was hidden and raised by a certain individual by the name of Stefan Progon in the village of Karameri. Stefan Progon later gave him his daughter for a wife and in the end helped him return to power in his father's homeland. The legend from Muzaki allows Karl Hoff to link three brothers, Georgia, Tanush and Dukajin. In reality, it was Georgia, Tanush and Progon, with whom we find mentioned in sources at the end of the 14th century. Although this whole exposition portrays the legend, the inevitable element of which is the rescue of a young son who regains his lost power in his older age. Both Karl Hoff and Vikentia Makushev linked this Dukajim from folklore to one of the leaders of the resistance who fought the Angevin Normans in Albania, who is mentioned as Dukem Genium Tanushum in the Angevin historical records dated from 1281. Charles I of Anjou ordered a castellan called Trani to take custody of a duke in Albania, as well as a Greek who was a nobleman from the Palelagos court. They had been captured for treason by the captain of Duras. The captain took them over for safekeeping when they were transferred from Duras to Manfredonia in Apulia, Italy. Dux Genius is based on the Eastern Roman Byzantine title Ducas Genos, which most likely gave rise to the family name of Dukajin. Dukajin has a meaning in Serbian, but it has no meaning in today's Shiptar Albanian. The Serbian word Duka means chief or duke in English, while the Serbian word Gene means great or giant. It is said that the Latinized form of the Serbian Gene is Gin, which is spelled G-I-N. Jean derives from the old Serbian word div, which is the root form for many grandiose meaning, such as divo for god, divan for divine, and so on. Duka plus Jean gives you Dukajin. Dukajin put together means great chief or chief leader. Therefore, even the exact Latin translation of dux genius means chief leader in Serbian. The creation historian and one of the founding members of Albanology, Milan Shufrai, also accepts the possibility that this Jin Tanos was probably a supporter of the Eastern Roman Byzantine Palologos, but also perhaps a flag bearer or a duke in the army of the Serbian king. He therefore acquired the name Duke, which became preserved in the name of Dukajan with the possibility that he was later killed by Catholic mountaineers who were under the leadership of the Benedictine abbot in Trafandia. However, the murder occurred due to him being a supporter of Orthodox rulers and not because of his wife and the alleged bishop affair. If we take that so-called Jin Thanos to be the ancestor of the latter Dukajans, between him and the Dukajans who are first mentioned by sources from the second half of the 14th century, there is a missing gap of almost a hundred years. This means that there is no continuity that would allow the establishment of a genealogical connection. We find the name Thanos among the Dukajans. However, this is the Latinized form that was kept in the Angevin archives. Tanush is in fact the Latinized version of the Serbian Atanasie Atanas or Tanashko. 
the son of the so-called Jin Thanos, who Karl Hoff mentions in the genealogy as Gina I, is too shrouded in legend and therefore unreliable, and Progon I, whom Hoff has listed as the next link in the family tree, had nothing to do with the Dukajans. In the charter issued on September 2nd, 1368, to the citizens of Dubrovnik by the Lord of Canina and Valona, who was known as Alexander, it is mentioned that amongst his nobles there is a duke called Prodan. Karl Hoff reads his name as Progan instead of Prodan, a name that often appears among the Dukajans in the 14th and 15th centuries. Hoff assessed that this Prodan could also be one of the Dukajans. Karl Hoff tied Leka and Pavle to the so-called Progan as his sons, therefore he could begin the true genealogy of the Kajans, at least those who were well known and prominent in the political events of their time. An important point to note is that Prodan is a Serbian name and is most likely the original form of these individuals that are called Progon by Karl Hoff. Progon, however, does have a meaning in Serbian. It means persecution. It is mentioned, however, in the Dubrovnik archives that a certain Nikola Stefani Tudorovic Dukajan paid the debt to Sir Viti Gucetic in 1377, but there is no possibility that he is related to any member of the Dukajans. Relying on Muzakar's report, according to which, in addition to the real Dukajans, referred to as Rakasa Deveri Dukajini, there are other Dukajans whose lineage does not descend from the right house. Milan Shufrai sees a certain Nikola as one of the representatives of those Dukajans. Muzaki's exposition does not apply to him in any way. It is a reflection of the mutual conflicts between the so-called real Dukajans around 1430 when rumours spread about the dubious origin of Leka Dukajan's immediate descendants. All these so-called real Dukajans come from two brothers, Leka and Pavle, who on December 30, 1387, invited the people of Dubrovnik to come freely into their country. Both were no longer alive in 1393, when Leka's sons, who were called Progon and Tanus, negotiated with the Venetians, along with Pavle's sons, who were also called Tanus and Progon. Leka and Pavle's sons are referred to in the negotiations. Two branches of the Dukajan house are already being created, Leka's and Pavle's lineages. Mozaki also talks about Leka's lineage, although Leka's name is by no means mentioned. Muzaki knows only about three brothers, George as the eldest, then two younger brothers by the name of Tanush and the so-called Dukajan, who is in fact called Progon. George had an older son called Nikola as well as other children. Tanush had a son called George as well as others. All of them, according to Muzaki, perished in the battles against the Turks, so that only Pavle Dukajan remained. According to Mozaki, Pavlev was married to the sister of Arianita Komnina, and when he and his children died, the real house of Dukajim was extinguished. Only the descendants of the third brother remain, the so-called Dukajin, but they moved to Venice. There is some trace of reality in this exposition, whilst the details are still quite confusing. In the first place, nowhere in the archive data is Georgia mentioned as their brother. The agreement with the Venetians from 1393 would certainly mention that if this was the case, so therefore we must not directly link him and his descendant Chureka and Pavle. It is certain, however, that Borsha, the wife of the Lord of Dan, Leka Zakaria, was Leka's daughter, which means she was the sister of Tanush and Progon. Leka's son, Progon, married Voislava in 1394, who was the daughter of the previous Lord of Dures, Carlo Topia. The marriage was concluded with the approval of the Venetian Senate because Voislava's first husband, Kursak, was convicted and executed in Dures at the end of 1393 or the beginning of 1394 for the murder of a certain individual called Borilo. 
The so-called program and voice lover live together for a short period of time due to program being appointed by the Prince of Skadar, Giovanni Capella, as the captain of the Sati fortress. He ended up dying defending himself from the Turks. Karl Hoff states that Progon's descendant, who eventually, according to Muzaki, settled in Venice. The Brankovic, however, in 1400, after Wojslava's death, pointed out the right to some jewellery that belonged to Giorgio Tapia, which was in Wojslava's possession. The question arises, how could the Brankovic bypass the rights of Progon children if those children were alive? Lekas Dukajin's second son, the so-called Tanosh, in order to distinguish himself from his cousin, who also had the same name, was called Tanos the Great during his lifetime. Thanks to the statement that Tanos himself gave to the Prince of Skadar, Giovanni Boldu, in 1435, accurate information about his family has been held. At that time, Tanos Veliki had two sons, Pavle, who was 24 years old, who was already married and had one son, and Leka, who was the second son, who was 15 years old. In addition to them, he had two daughters, Charia, who was married, and the other, whose name is not given, was a 14-year-old girl. They all lived in Skadar at that time. In his report, Giovanni Boldu states that all these children were born in a legal marriage, probably because of the time when other prominent representatives of the Dukajin house perished in the fight against the Turks. Word began to spread that Pavle and his brother Leka were not real Dukajins. These other Dukajins, as Yoram Muzaki notes, do not descend from the Dukajin house lineage, but have reportedly descended from Pavle Dukajin, who was raised by Ivan Kastriot. Giovanni Boldu's report corrects Hoff's incorrect genealogy, according to which Tanush Veliki's first son, who was Pavlev's brother, was a certain individual by the name of George. Tanush Veliki himself, who was arrested and then released in Venice, was transferred in 1438 to Padua, where in fact all trace of him was lost forever. Tanush Veliki's son, by the name of Leka is mentioned along with his brother Pavle in 1445. Leka again this time is mentioned as a Venetian outlaw in 1451. All later trace of him is lost either due to death or simple classification among the other Dukajin, generally mentioned in the documents. The activities of the eldest son of Tanush Veliki, Pavle, can be traced from beginning to end. He was born in 1411 and died at the end of 1458. According to Muzaki, Pavle had four sons, Nicola, Leka, Progon and George. The documents mention Nicola and Leka the most, whose descendants eventually settled in Ancona, today's Italy. Leka was the most prominent amongst the brothers. It can be assumed that he was also the oldest. In negotiations with the Venetians at the beginning of 1459, he is mentioned as the head of the other brothers. It is this Leka in particular that the laws of Northern Albania were named after him as the canon of Leka Dukajin. Traces of Leka begin to disappear at a time when refugees from Zeta and Albania were returning to their homeland in 1481. Data on Leka's descendants in Ancona were given by Karl Hoff. Pavle's son, Nicola, is seldom mentioned in documents by name. He was known to have been in conflict with Leka in 1468 and then reconciled with him later. In 1471, Nicola approached the Venetians, although his son was already loyal to the Sultan at that time. As a man loyal to the Venetians, Nicola fought against the Turks, was defeated together along with Leka in 1479. After the death of Mehmed II, Nicola returned at the same time as Leka to Albania. Pavle's third son, Progon, who was a faithful Venetian subject, is mentioned in 1471 as deceased. Archival documents mention nothing about George, he is only mentioned by Muzaka. The descendants of the older Pavle Dukajin, who is mentioned with his brother Eleka in 1387, disappeared from the political stage in northern Albania much earlier. It is not possible to determine exactly how many sons Pavle actually had. First, in 1393, the so-called Progon and Tanush are mentioned, and later, in 1402, 
Pavle and Tanush are mentioned with the nickname Perak. Progon first disappeared. He died between May and July 1394 in Dalmatia on his return from Venice after holding negotiations where he was still with one member of the Dukagians. All traces lost of Pavle later on. Tanush was the only one to stand out in the document. He is mentioned as Tanush Mari in order to distinguish himself from Leka's son, Tanush Veliki. Under this name in 1430, he is last mentioned in Dubrovnik news, which lists him as deceased in 1433. Karl Hoff omits Pavle in his genealogy and mentions Andrea, identifying him with Rashka. Andrea is admittedly mentioned in 1406 as Pavle's son, but he was a citizen of Skadar and therefore has no ground to declare him as the brother of Tanush Mali. He is listed as deceased in 1417 in the Skadar catastrophe. Rashko is a completely different person, one of the Dukagians who served in Duras. Andrea's son, the alleged Leka II, is the result of a misreading of archival documents that the Venetian Senate mentions from 1407. Georgia Dukagian's son, Nicola, played a much bigger role in the political life of Albania. Georgia himself, who is mentioned as a Venetian Pranaya in the vicinity of Skadar in 1403 and who was not alive in 1409, was indisputably closely related to Leka and Pavle's descendants. According to Muzaki, he states that three of Arianita Komnin's eight daughters married Dukagians. Kirana married Nicola, Yelena married Georgia, and Despina married Tanush. Hoff assumes that they are the three sons of this Georgia Dukagian. He even attributes all the data relating to Tanush Veliki to this Tanush, the so-called Tanush IV. So he notes that Tanush is lost without trace in 1438, which means at the time when Leka's son, Tanush, was acquitted in Venice and was transferred to Padua. According to Muzaki's chronicles, their descendants became Turkified on the basis of archival material. Only the activities of George's son, Nicola, can be traced, whilst there is no data about the others. Nicola first appears in 1409 and from 1431 he is mentioned very often as a significant political figure. He died sometime between 1452 and 1454. Nicola's sons were Drago and Giorgio. Drago, whom the records of the Venetian Senate records for the first time in 1458, is mentioned after four years in 1462 as deceased. He was ambushed and died together with his brother Giorgio. Only Giorgio's son, who was also called Nicola, survived. This Nicola entered the Venetian service, but no further significant reports were ever heard of him again. Additional Dukagians who are vaguely mentioned are Andrian and Ivan Dukagian, who was a priest living in the immediate vicinity of Skadar. Budimir Dukagian was also a businessman. In 1452, there was also another individual called Theodor Dukagian. In Dubrovnik, in 1433, there was a certain Vuk Dukagian, who was mentioned to have received a gift from the government. All of them had Serbian Slavic names and none of them spoke Shiptar or identified as Shiptars. On 2nd of June 1403, the Venetian state confirmed that the three brothers Goranin, Damian and Nenad of the Dushman family are the rulers of Pilate. The Serbian Dushmans are originally said to be from Montenegro and northern Albania. Dushman means soul or spirit in Serbian. Some members of the Serbian Dushman tribe have become Shiptars, mostly through forced conversion to Islam by the Ottomans. They are known as Dushmani among the Shiptar Albanians of today. On March 2nd, 1444, the Dushmans, along with Dukagians, became one of the original founding members of Skanderberg's Yeshka League, which was founded in the city of Yesh. The key members of the league were Reka Zaharie with Pavle and Nikola Dukajin, Peter Span, Reka Dushman, Juro Stres Balsha, Andrea Topia, Juro Arianit Komninovic, Theodor Muzaci, Stefan Senojevic, and of course Skanderbeg. According to Marin Barretti, in 1445, 
During the ceremony of the marriage of Skanderbeg's sister, Mami Sakastriotic, Leka Dukajan had a dispute with the Serbian noble lord, Leka Zaharia. The reason for this dispute was because of a woman named Irena Dushman, who was the heir of the Serbian noble Dushman family. She seemed to prefer Leka Zaharia, and this was not accepted by Leka Dukajan himself. A skirmish happened and Leka Dukajan remained wounded, saved only by the intervention of Skanderbeg's most trusted general, Vrana Konti. Vrana means crow in Serbian, or as some sources note him, as Brano, which is a Serbian name. Vrana or Brano was a Serbian who was related to Skanderbeg's mother, Vojislava. Both were noted to be Marquis of Tripalda, Tripalda meaning Tribali, which was another name for Serbs, as noted by Jovan Muzaka. Even the famous albanologist Oliver Jen Schmidt confirmed this as a fact. According to Venetian chronicler Stefano Magno, it was Nikola Dukajin, Zaharia's vassal, who killed Leka Zaharia in the battle, not Leka Dukajin, as stated by Marin Barletti. Stefano Magno also stated, Before he died, Leka Zaharia expressed the wish that his property should be handed over to the Venetian Republic. In two Venetian documents of the year 1403, Giorgio Dukajin is also mentioned who was a small feudal lord and a loyal vassal of the Venetians, to whom the Venetian count captain of Skadar had given a few villages in administration. He is known to have formed a small army of 50 knights and 100 infantrymen in that region. Nicola Dukajan was the son of this Georgia Dukajan. Nicola appears for the first time in 1409, in the same year as his father's death. According only to Jovan Muzaka, Georgia had three sons who were called Georgia, Tanosh and Nikola. I've listed all the names only mentioned by Jovan Muzaka in red. There are no other historical sources to confirm that Nicholas brothers, the so-called Tanosh and Georgia mentioned by Muzaka ever existed. The documents of the time gives only one of them, Nicola. Nicola participated in the revolts of 1432-1436, during which he succeeded in regaining the territory held by his family before the Ottoman conquest of Albania. He even managed to capture Dan, which he promptly granted to Venice. Unwilling to provoke the Ottomans, Venice returned Dan to Ottoman control in 1435. Nicola later took part in the Liberation Uprising of 1443 and was one of the founding members of the League of Yesh in 1444. He became an important political figure in the region. When Nicola Dukajin killed Leka Zahari in 1444, the Venetian Republic took over control of Zahari's former realm. Nicola Dukajin continued his struggle against the new authorities and managed to capture the fortress which was known as Sati and several villages. He later concluded peace with Venice and in 1446 he is recorded in Venetian archives as the former enemy. Conflict broke out between the Venetians and Skanderbeg at the end of 1447 and it lasted until the end of 1448 when the Serbian despot set out with his army to return the lost Zeta cities. Amongst the nobles who supported Skanderbeg were also the Dukajans. The Venetians sought out to buy the Dukajans by promising them money, land and security. They wanted to persuade Nikola and Pavle Dukajan to leave Skanderbeg's side so that Skanderbeg would be weakened politically and the Venetians would be able to gain more power and control. The new conflicts with the Serbian despots made the situation more difficult for the Venetians and there was no other way out but to make peace with Skanderbeg and his noblemen who were represented at the negotiations by Nikola Dukajan. Negotiations ended on October 4, 1448, in the vicinity of Yesh. According to the agreement, the Venetians were granted the possession of Dan and several other villages. Several other villages in the area of Dan, which was held by Pavle Dukajan, were in dispute. The negotiators promised the Venetian providors that Pavle Dukajan would return those villages to the Republic. If he did not agree to that, the Venetians would use their forces against him and not being afraid of Skanderbeg and Nicola Dukajan. Despite the Venetians' threat, Skanderbeg relented due to the Turks advancing in Albania during their summer campaigns and he himself failed to penetrate Dan despite a long siege. 
In the following years, the Venetians fought a war with the Serbian despot Skanderbeg over the Zeta states. Skanderbeg became preoccupied as well with strong Turkish attacks. This gave the Dukajans the opportunity, using the preoccupation of their more powerful neighbours, to pursue petty politics in order to expand their own domain and territory. Skanderbeg's power and territorial control bothered members of the Dukajan family, the Venetians saw opportunities to cause internal strife between the ruling nobles, especially between the Dukajans and Skanderbeg himself. The Venetians also saw Skanderbeg's struggle against the Turks as a personal matter, even though he was removing the danger of Turkish invasion from their borders. In order to preserve peace with the Ottomans, the Venetians did not oppose the position of Dukajan, who according to Stefan Magno, in the midst of the fiercest struggle in 1450, became affiliated with the Turks and they even plundered the villages in the Dan district. Apparently there were not Venetian villages, but settlements owned by sister Zakaria Boya. Despite the Dukajan ties with the Turks and their pressure on other people's estates, the Venetians considered the brothers Pavle and Leka, and later Pavle's son, who was also called Leka, to be one of their mercenaries in Zeta and in Albania. Nicola Dukajan and his sons were considered good and faithful servants by the Venetians. According to Oliver Jen Schmidt, in March 1451, Leka Dukajan and Bozidab Dushman planned an attack on Drivast, which was under Venetian control. Their conspiracy is revealed and Bozidab Dushman is forced to flee into exile. The conflict between the Dukajans and Skanderbeg caught the attention of Pope Nicholas V and King Alfonso of Naples, to whom, rejected by the Venetians, Skanderbeg, the leader of the anti-Turkish resistance in Albania, was closely tied to. The Venetians would insinuate that the Dukajans would plan to assassinate Skanderbeg in 1452. However, there is no historical proof that the Dukajans ever did so. On September 25th, 1452, Thanks to the efforts of the Archbishop of Bar, the Bishop of Drivast and other prelates, reconciliation took place between Skanderbeg and the Dukajans. However, a later papal letter dated 22nd of August 1454 shows that the Dukajans then refused invitations and warnings, so the Pope threatened them with excommunication and threw an interdict on their lands. The influence of Nicola Dukajan led to a deep gap breaking between the Dukajans and Skanderbeg, and this conflict remained for several years more. According to Stavros Skendi, together with many other noblemen in the land of Albania, after disputes with the Venetians and other Serbian nobility, Nicola Dukajan abandoned Skanderbeg's forces and deserted to the Ottomans. Ottomans allowed him to govern 25 villages in Dibar and 7 villages in Trafandia. Nicola's son Drago inherited these villages after his father's death. Nicola died before 1454. The Dukajans renounced their alliance with Skanderbeg in 1454 after the death of Nicola Dukajan. They promised they would make peace with him and they stated the reason why they approached the Turks was due to the closeness of their territories. It was then that the Dukajans fully accepted Skanderbeg's political stance. A few years later, two branches of the Dukajan family began to enter into a civil strife. Pavle's young son, Leka, was at the head of the fight. At a time when the Turks were undergoing strong attacks on Albania, in 1455 and 1456, Leka Dukajan served in Dan. With the help of an insider, he managed to overthrow the Venetian lord of Dan. The Venetians reported back to their superiors that the masters behind this attack had the support of Skanderbeg. The Venetians would begin preparations in order to assemble an army that would overthrow Leka Dukajan. The battles for Dan dragged on until mid-August 1457, and exhausted all funds available to the Venetian treasury. Meanwhile, the Turks invaded Skanderbeg's lands with great force, occupied the plains, ravaged the villages and prepared for a decisive attack on Croya. Skanderbeg retreated to the mountains with a rather bleak prospect of success. Burning and destroying, the Turks penetrated the walls of Skadar and Dan, which the Venetians barely managed to capture from Leka Dukajan. The sons of Nicola Dukajan also took part in the fighting, led by the oldest son Drago, who approached the Venetians during the preparations for the war. With the help of the Venetians, 
Drago managed to return the estates that Leka took away from them at that time, but he lost them again during the Turkish invasion. Leka Dukajim would be forced to retreat. In the autumn of 1457, Leka and Pavle Dukajin informed the Prince of Skadar and the Venetian Providor of Albania of the desire to make peace with the Venetians. The Venetian cautiously accepted the offer. The negotiations failed and during the winter months Leka sided with the Turks. Using the Turks as aid to assist him in his fight against the Venetians, Leka also used this opportunity to ravage the estates of the Venetian royal subject Drago Dukajin. Drago Dukajin was one of Nicholas Dukajin's two sons. His brother was called George. Both of them were killed in an ambush that was led by Leka Dukajin, who first captured many of Drago's villages in 1462. One of the descendants remained, George's infant son, who was also called Nicola, who eventually entered the service of the Venetian Republic. After several years of hostility between Skanderbeg and the Dukajans, both sides were reconciled thanks to the intervention of Bishop Pavle Angel in 1464, who managed to separate Leka from the Turks. This also led to Skanderbeg breaking the truce with the Turks. The reconciliation between Skanderbeg and Leka Dukajan was favoured due to the growing threat of Turkish invasion, which was directed towards the possessions of the Dukajans. There was also another Nikola Dukajan, who was the brother of Leka Dukajan, as well as Progon and Georgia. Since then, the Dukajans, under the command of Leka and his brother Nikola Dukajan, have fought all the Turks. In Skanderbeg's last preparation for the defence of Croya from the Turkish siege, Leka stood at the head of one of his larger armies and fought strongly against the Turks. Leka Dukajan fought along Skanderbeg and remained fully loyal to him. According to Marin Barletti, it was Leka that was at Skanderbeg's deathbed and announced the death of this majestic warrior. After the death of Skanderbeg in 1468, Nicola Dukajan and his brothers Leka and Progon all became allied to Venice in leading the Ottoman resistance. Following the Ottoman retreat after the first siege of Skadar in August 1474, the Turkish army destroyed and burned the inhabited surrounding region, including the castle of Dan, despite the strong resistance led by the brothers Nikola and Leka Dukajin. The Ottoman Empire captured Kroya in 1478 and shortly afterward Drivast and Yesh. Many local fighters were engaged in the defence of the town during the second siege of Skadar between 1478 and 1479, including several ex-warriors of Skanderbeg. Theodore and Budomir Dukajan, two cousins of Leka Dukajan, were amongst the fallen soldiers in this battle. After 1479, when the main castles and Albanian cities of Yesh, Drivas, Kroya, Skadar all fell, Nicola and Leka Dukajan were forced to emigrate to Italy along with other nobles like Sanojevic. On January 25, 1479, the Republic of Venice signed the Treaty of Constantinople with the Ottoman Empire, according to which the city of Skadar was ceded to the Ottomans on the condition that its citizens would be free to leave. Eventually, on April 25th, 1479, the Ottoman forces entered Skadar, which triggered massive emigrations of the local people, mostly towards Venice. The noble Dukajan family settled in Koper, which is in today's Slovenia, which at the time was under the rule of the Venetian Republic when Albania became subjugated by the Turks in the 15th century. With the fall of Skadar, which was defended by the Dukajans, the family brought the castle of Servolo with its annexed villages which became their new homeland and became included in the register of the nobles of Koper. Also, according to Prospero Petronio, even in the new homeland, the Dukajans were unable to give up their aristocratic habit and therefore, using quantities of gold, bought the castle of Servolo with its annexed villages. In Istria, the Dukajans managed several villages, including Servolo, Odoriso, Bagnoli and Servola. An interesting point to note is that Servolo is the Latinized form of the term Serbian. Such terms such as Servian, Servolo, Servitor, Servis are all greto latin metaphysic shifts that refer to the Serbs. With the death of Sultan Mehmed II on 3rd of May 1481 and the following civil unrest that broke out in the Ottoman Empire, 
This led to the hope that the Turks could be pushed out of Bosnia and Albania and this caused many people to start returning back. In early summer 1481, Nikola Dukajin and his brother Leko Dukajin, along with Ivan Sinojevic, returned to Albania. In 1481, Leka and Nikola Dukajin returned to Albania and joined an anti-Ottoman armed movement that was led by Jovan Kastriot, who was the son of Skanderbeg. 1481 is the last we ever hear of Leka Dukajin and his brother Nikola. Both of them disappear into history having fought the Turks in the northern Albanian highlands as well as Skadar. As time went on, a branch of the Dukajan family defected and moved to Turkey, to the Sultan's court, pursuing a diplomatic career. The viziers Dukajinad Mehmet and Dukajinad Yahya Bey and Ali Bey should be mentioned. The most important was Dukajinad Yahya Bey, who later became the Ottoman administrator of Bosnia and one of the greatest poets of Ottoman literature of the classical period. Also, individual exponents of the Dukajans moved to Venetian Istria around 1570, carrying out important assignments in the military and administrative fields for the Republic of Venice. However, as Prospero Petronio reports, the Dukajans died out a short time later in 1609. The Dukajan family is also mentioned by Nicola Manzuri as a noble family which is said to have become extinct in 1609. According to a legend, Leka Dukajan had two sons, Nicola and Bieri Pavle, from whom several tribes arose. The most famous amongst them are the Biela Pavliches. According to the established folk legend, they originate from Bieri Pavle from Perch, the son of the Serbian lord Leka Dukajan, whilst according to the same tradition, the so called Albanian tribe Gashani originates from Leka's other son, Gavrilo, otherwise known as Gasha. Bieli Pavle moved to Montenegro, and from him come the Bielo Pavliches, which is a large tribe of Orthodox faith that settled by the river Zeta. Gasha remained in North Albania, and from him came the Muslim tribe called Gashi, which is situated east of Krasnic, who also became Albanized. There is also a legend that states that the origin of the Biela Pavliches is from Leka Kapitan, who is said to have been a member of the Dukajans. Serbian tribes from Montenegro and the so-called North Albanian tribes are traditionally closely related as many of them are Albanized Serbs. This is also evident through Y-DNA genealogical testing. Karl Hoff did mention two individuals by the names of Pavle and Nikola as descendants of Leka Dukajan. If that truly is the case, then it appears that the legend could be very true.